So, so I'm going to talk today about the demography of longevity, and I'm going to cover uh, uh, several related topics. The, the, uh, the first topic uh, pertains to the uh, frontier of survival. And I'd like you to go back 20 years to the early 1990s, and uh, I'll summarize what was known then, and then I'll try to describe to you what's been discovered over the past 20 years. In, in 1992, the main view held by 90% uh, of scholars was that the fixed front, there, was, there was a fixed frontier of survival, that lifespans were limited, and that human life expectancy was close to a looming limit. And the, the basic idea was that there were two kinds of death. There's premature death, which could be prevented, and then there's death from old age, natural death, senescent death, which, and nothing could be done about this. And, and this idea goes back, you know, almost everything goes back either to Aristotle or Plato. This goes back to Aristotle. And Aristotle wrote an essay in 350 BC where he said there's two kinds of death and the other senescent. And, and he compared the life to a, a fire in the heart of a hole. And the, um, he said you could put the fire out by throwing sand or water on the fire, or you could let the fire burn down. And the fire would naturally burn down. And that was natural death. And nothing could be done about natural death. Everybody had a maximum lifespan. And uh, James Fries in 1980 wrote an extremely influential article in the New England Journal of Medicine where he said the same thing. So this view uh, pre prevailed for a very long time. The, uh, then, uh, then there was a second group of people, a small minority 20 years ago, a much bigger group today. And they, this group of people said, yes, there is a frontier of survival, but if we can find out the secret, we can break through this frontier of survival. And the, the, uh, you can trace this back to the ancient Greeks, but the, maybe the best example was uh, Cornaro, uh, who was a famous Italian. I was in Rome and saw an exhibition uh, the other night, and his name was mentioned. He's apparently a fa fairly famous Italian scholar. And he wrote a book in 1558, which was the best seller in Europe for three years after the Bible. And the, and the book was called The Art of Living Long. And what's the secret? He had a secret. Dietary restrictions. And today, I don't know if you read the papers, but today a lot of people think that dietary restriction is the secret to longevity. But this, this is, theory's been, um, been advanced ever since uh, the 1500s. And, and then there's lots of other theories, you know, if you drink enough red wine, you'll live longer. If you, if you have sex with young virgins, you'll live longer. If you, know, the, 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 if you eat tomatoes for breakfast, you'll live longer. There's all, there's all sorts of secrets. And uh, the, if you have the right genes, you'll live longer. And if we could only find these genes in worms, then we can try to export these genes to humans. So, so the, and there are large numbers of people now working on trying to find the secrets of longevity. Uh, different laboratories that are studying caloric restriction, studying genes in various uh, laboratory species, studying uh, the, the substance in red wine that's so useful. And uh, there are more, I did a rough count, there are more laboratories worrying about trying to find the secret of longevity than there are demographers. Mm -hmm. And then, then, then the, uh, the third view, which was only held by a handful of people in 1990, was the frontier of survival is advancing. We just don't know it, because we don't have any data. And in 1990, life tables in all the countries of the world ended either at 80 or 85. And there was no published data, no systematic published data after 85 for any country. So uh, I wrote a, a paper where I hypothesized that we were making progress, but I had no evidence that we were making progress. I just knew we were making progress at younger ages. So, if you're a good demographer and you want data, what do you do? You go to Stockholm, because Sweden has the world's best demographic data. They've been keeping uh, vital statistics since 1650. They got pretty good at it at 1750. They were really good at it at 1850. So, so I went to Stockholm and I talked with Hans Lundström and he took me down to the basement of the uh, archives of Statistics Sweden and showed me all the records, all the paper records. And so I raised some money and he computerized the data, the death counts and the population counts above age 85 for Sweden from 1860 to almost 1990. And here are the results. So we have, I'm just going to show 1900 to 1990. The, the uh, risk of death against year from 1900 on and this is age 85. And you can see it was about 20% chance of death. 
until 1950, and then declined to under 10% in recent years. And here, this is for females. Uh, this is age 90, again, pretty constant up until 1950, and then a steep decline uh, afterwards. And there, there aren't very many 95-year-old Swedes, but here's 95, bounces around. But again, fairly constant, as far as you can tell, in a, in a fairly steep decline. So the, the, uh, the truth of the matter is we are making progress in bringing death rates down, even at the highest ages. For men, it's a little bit less dramatic, but almost, almost as much. And so since uh, publication of this article, there's lo lots of work has been done, and uh, I'll show you women and men in some different countries. So here, here is uh, Sweden. This is octogenarians, so women in their 80s. And you can see, and once again, I started in 1950, and you can see this uh, steady uh, and radical decline. Here's uh, France, even better than Sweden. And here's Japan, really remarkable. The Japanese have the longest life expectancy in the world. And uh, here's the United States. So the United States is So the the uh, and uh, so I put I, and I put Italy on as well the the uh, and you can see that Italy is doing you know very well about the same as the other countries doing well. There's a, something called the Human Mortality Database that has data for lots of countries. So here's the other countries. But we, and then for men we see the same kind of thing, uh, except for the United States and even for the United States recently, uh, just dramatic reductions in mortality. Although the men have higher mortality than. Them. The women. Now the, so the, one way to, another way to think about this is to look at how many people make it to age 100, how many people make it to age 105. I was chair of a meeting uh, the last couple of days in Rome where we studied people who were 105 and older, in particular people who were 110 and older. So let me show you the number of people in Sweden who made it to 100. Uh, this is females again. Isn't that something? So, this is zero there, by the way. Nobody, in, in the, over the course of the 19th century, in, in a couple of years there was one person, a couple of years, I mean, in a few years there was one person, a couple of years there were two people. But basically, nobody was 100. And then starting around 1950, this very, very steep rise in the number of people who made it to 100. And the reason is that after 1950, we started making progress against mortality after age 80. It's easy to make it to 80. It's very hard to make it from 80 to 100. And therefore, you get this very steep rise. And now I'm going to show you the most remarkable rise you've ever seen. Japanese women, 105 plus. Nobody straight up. Right? It's still a small number, but it's really remarkable change. Now the, so the first major discovery was the advancing frontier of survival. I want to tell you briefly about two supplemental discoveries. The first is that survival is advancing because aging is being postponed. It's not being slowed down. And so let me describe briefly what this means. So suppose from age 70 to age 80, you, a person loses a certain amount of health, a person becomes more frail and decrepit between 70 and 80. If we were slowing aging down, then this process of senescence between 70 and 80 would be stretched out. So instead of being from 70 to 80, it would be from 70 to 85 or 70 to 90. Over time, it would be gradually stretching out. But instead, what's happening is the health that people used to have at age 70, they now have at age 70 or, 70, or age 80 or 85 or 90. That we're, we're postponing. So, so 80 is the new 70. And we're postponing the age at which you uh, reach a certain level of mortality. We're not slowing down the process, but we're postponing the process of senescence. So let me, let me just show you an example of this. So here are women in, in Sweden, the United States, and Japan, and X5 is the age when your life expectancy is five, you should write your will. 
and X10 is when your life expectancy is 10. And you can see there was not very much change in Sweden, but then an increase of about 10 years, and the same thing for Japan and the same thing uh, for the United States. And also you can see that the, the various curves, the X5 curves and the X10 curves are more or less parallel. So they're, they're going up together. There's no, there's no evidence of postponement. I mean, there's strong evidence of postponement. There's no evidence of deceleration. And let me, let me show you another way to look at this. So here's Swedish females from 30 to 90. The risk of death on a log scale. It's on a log scale and mortality goes up exponentially, so we're going to get straight lines. So here's the chance of death for Swedish females in 1950. Nice exponential curve. And here in 1980, See, the curves are not diverging, they're shifting in parallel. And here, in 2010, again, shift. And the, the, uh, and you can see, if we, one interesting point is the age when your risk of death is 1%, and one person out of 100 is dying. And the, uh, in 1950, that was age 57 for this population. And in 1980, it was 63. And in 2010, it's 68. So 68 is the new 57. And, but it's, a, it's this postponement of senescence, not a deceleration of senescence. The, uh, and here's a table for different countries. So let's just take France as an example. The uh, females uh, who are 70 years old today in France have the same probability of death as 59-year-old French females had 50 years ago. And the same thing for French males. So that the, the, uh, the mortality of 59-year-old uh, French females and males 50 years ago was equivalent to the mortality of 70-year-old today. And it turns out that the chance of death is a, is a good, not a perfect, but a good indicator of health. Uh, and Benjamin Gompers, way back in 1825, said the most fundamental aspect of health was the ability to withstand destruction. That's mortality. And, and lots of other health indicators are correlated with uh, mortality. So the, uh, you could look at some of these other indicators, and roughly speaking, the health of French men and women age 59, 60, is about 50 years ago, is about the same as the health of French men and women on average at age 70 today. I'm not going to belabor this, but this has relevance for retirement policy. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is the fact that the advancing frontier of survival is part of a larger long-term life expectancy revolution. So I want to briefly describe this life expectancy re revolution to you. So here's the, a picture that we published in Science a decade ago. That we looked at the countries that had the world's longest life expectancy, as far as we can tell. And from the, in the 1500s and 1600s, first part of the 1700s, it was England. And, the, the, uh, and you can see that life expectancy was about 35 or 40 over this long period of time. And so far as we can tell from data on monks and nuns and aristocrats and skeletal data and so on, no population in the world over the long-term history of the world, the last 10,000 years, had life expectancy much above 35 or 40. And some populations had substantially lower life expectancies. The estimate is that when England had a life expectancy of 35, Italy had a life expectancy of 20. So, then, around 1800, 1840, 1850, life expectancy started to go up. And you can see this, this uh, linear rise in life expectancy. And let me blow this up for you. The, in 1840, Swedish women had the world's longest life expectancy was 45. And then, over the course of the next decades, various countries had the world's longest life expectancy. I, I put in a few dots for Sweden just to show you that Sweden fell behind. But there's this is linear rise. And then, uh, in recent decades, it's been Japan. And the last, you know, the last three years, uh, Japanese life expectancy has been above 86 for women, 86 and a half now. And here's the line. Isn't that amazing? The R squared is 0.992. Really linear. And uh, the, the, these, these, these points are not on the line. They're just sweet. And the, the, the uh, uh, so I, I think this is probably the most 
remarkable regularity of mass human endeavor ever observed, because it's a linear regularity for 170 years, from 1840 until today. And the country has changed, the causes of death have changed, the ages at which we're making progress have changed, we still have this linear rise. And, and how, how fast is this linear rise? But two and a half years per decade. Two and a half years per decade for 170 years. And two and a half years per decade is three months per year. And three months per year is six hours per day. A lot of things see has been going up in the country is doing best by six hours a day for almost 200 years. Six hours per day. Huh? Okay. So this lecture is free. And the, 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 the uh, here's Sweden. So Sweden was the leader, it fell behind, it caught up, it fell behind again. Uh, here's France. So you can see di individual countries don't follow the straight line. The straight line is the frontier. But France caught up and then fell back a little bit. And, and here's uh, East and West Germany. I wanted to show you East and West Germany because the, uh, I don't know if you can see, East Germany is in light blue and West Germany is in the dark blue. The uh, following unification in 1990, there was a sh sharp rise in East German life expectancy. The East Germans caught up within a few years. And then uh, here's the United States. And again, the United States was close to the world's leader and then fell back. And, and here's Italy. Not bad. So Italy was doing pretty badly uh, 100 years ago, but caught up rapidly and then now is one of the world's leaders. And one of the interesting things in looking at this is you can see World War I and the Spanish flu and you can see World War II, and there's no memory of these disasters. You know, the disaster comes and goes and the trend continues with no long-term effects. So, why did we have this life expectancy revolution? And I don't have time today to talk about this at length, but there are two main reasons, as you might suspect. And the, the first is money. <coughs> this is East and West Germany before and after unification. And uh, the second is medicine. And the, so uh, the um, money broadly defined to be prosperity, education, socioeconomic status, and, uh, very broadly defined. And medicine broadly defined to mean public health. Uh, and the, the, uh, we're able to study this actually based on the uh, experiments, the, the natural experiment of East-West German unification, because that was unexpected, it came suddenly, and uh, on July, uh, in July 1990, East Germans, uh, East German mark was exchanged for the West German mark, one for one, even though the purchasing power of the East German mark was only 10% of the West German mark. So people with money had 10 times as much money, and the pensions were converted as well, so the people who were, had pensions got 10 times more uh, per month. And then it went up even higher because the, the uh, West German pensions were more generous than the East German pensions. So that within a couple of years, the East German pensioners were getting 20, 30 times more money than before. And then there was also a movement of the West German medical system into East Germany. And it was gradual, so it went to Berlin first, East Berlin first, then to the big cities, Leipzig, Dresden, Moscow, then to the smaller cities, then to the rural areas. So we, we can follow this progress. And so, because the money happened all at once, and the medicine and public health was more gradual, you can distinguish between how much is due to medicine, how much is due to money. But of course they're correlated, but you can try to make some rough uh, calculations. And it's, it's a wonderful natural experiment in studying democracy, not only longevity, but fertility. But the answer is not very exciting. It's 50-50, money and medicine. So, I want to now briefly touch on how much, how many of us work and how much do we work? The, the basic idea is that, I've done a lot of research on this, but I'll just touch on it today. The, if we're going to live longer and longer, then we're going to have to work longer, it's clear. And if 70 year olds are as healthy as 60 year olds were 50 years ago, we'll be able to work longer, at least the average person will be able to work longer. Um, so, and why do we have to work longer? Well, here's the, in Germany, the most recent data that we have, uh, there were 1.3 people who were not working for every person who was working. And 
in 2025, it's going to be 1.47. So, so it's about one to one now, and it's going to be one and a half to one. So that's a big change. And uh, it's uh, like a 30% increase in the burden on workers. Um, how much do Germans work? I'm going to show you Italians. <laughs> how much do Germans work? So, so what we calculated was, we just took a random work day, and how many hours we worked on that day, and then divided by the population to get the, uh, the hours worked per day, and then we did it per week. So the hours worked per week per capita. So, so this is actual work, you know, actually going to your place of work, not being sick, not being on vacation, not Christmas. But you're actually a worker. And we, all the work that's put in divided by the whole population. Of course, there's children, there's older people, there's people who don't work. But how much do you think children do? I was amazed when I found that it was 12 and a half hours a week. And you think Germans work so hard, huh? 12 and a half hours a week, on average, right? They have long vacations, six week vacations, lots of holidays. They get sick. They retire early, they start work late. 12 and a half hours a week. And uh, by 2025, 11 hours a week. So, I mean, this is a very small fraction of your time. So clearly there's, uh, first of all, it's going to be a burden. I mean, this is like an enormous burden on the workers. But the, the, uh, it shows you that there's lots of room for the redistribution of work. Is it, we work so little that it's possible to redistribute work among people uh, fairly easily, at least in principle. So here's, here's other countries. And here's Italy. So I don't know if the statistics are right. You have to be careful with Italian statistics. But, but apparently the Italians work considerably more than the Germans. And uh, the, the, uh, uh, so you can see, instead of 12 and a half hours, it's 13 hours. And <coughs> down to 11 is going down to 12. And in terms of the, of the uh, number of non-workers per worker, though, the Italians do have more non-workers than workers. But they, the people who do work, work, the amount of work put in is a little bit higher than the Germans. But in all of these countries, except the United States, things are getting worse. In the United States, things are getting better. And that's because there's lots of babies in the United States, because there's lots of in-migrants, and because people die young. So these three favorable factors help the labor market. OK. So I want to now turn to my third and final topic, uh, and that is, uh, Suppose you wanted to forecast life expectancy in the future. How could you go about forecasting? And this is rather speculative, but let me try to explain uh, why I think that the best way to forecast life expectancy is to extrapolate the long-term trends and then to ask whether things might be better or worse than this extrapolation and then, uh, and then try to make a judicious uh, judgment about whether it's going to be a little faster or a little slower than the long-term trend. And the, the reason I like the long-term trend for the, in the best practice countries is because it's so linear. And it doesn't show any sign of deceleration. So just, it's easy, you just two and a half years per decade, I can do it in my head. And then, and then you worry about whether Italy's going to be doing a little bit better or a little worse than that in the future. Um, and the, the, uh, it turns out that uh, if that's true, two and a half years per decade, three months per year, then you get a 40 year increase I mean, you get a 10-year increase in life expectancy over the next 40 years. So a full decade in 40 years. In 2050, people, according to this uh, forecast, will live 10 years longer. And it turns out that the remaining life expectancy at age 65 is going up almost as fast as life expectancy at birth. Not quite as fast, but almost as fast. So here's some data. And you can see not much happened for a long time. But then in recent years, especially since 1970, we have a linear rise in remaining life expectancy at 65. And it's not six hours a day, it's five hours a day, uh, four hours for men, five hours for women, but, but it's uh, still a lot, a lot of life expectancy being added even at the highest ages. And the, so again, here's different countries. So you have Sweden, France, East and West Germany, United States, and Italy. And basically all the countries are going up together, more or less, at some point. Now, I can't put this down. The, 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 uh, one of my students, Adam Leonard, came into my office one day and he said, Jim, 
life expectancy at birth has been going up by three months a year for 170 years. That, that's on a period basis, you know, every, every calendar year. How fast is life expectancy going up for cohorts, for generations of people born the same year? I said, Adam, three months. No, if it's three months for a period for 170 years, it's three months for cohorts. It's not, it's four months. And the reason is that a birth cohort, it takes them 80 years before they get to be age 80. And then during that 80-year period, a lot of progress has been made. And therefore, they live longer than people who would have been 80 the year that they were born. So they get a dividend, and the three months turns into four months. So, so I was a uh, uh, little, uh, it was the six hours per day was an underestimate for, for people, because we, we're not living our lives on a period basis, we're living our lives on a cohort basis. We're gaining eight hours a day. Amazing. And anyway, four months per year, eight hours a day. So if you just project this forward, most Italians born since the year 2000 will survive past 100, if, if the trend continues. So very long lives are not the distant privilege of remote future generations. Very long lives are the likely destiny of people alive today, if, if this 170-year trend continues into the future. So here's some calculations that we published in The Lancet a couple of years ago. And you can see for Italy, babies born in 2007, according to our projections, half of them will celebrate their 104th birthday. And you see, see how these numbers are going up? So, Mikko Mirskula, who's one of my colleagues in Rostock, said, Jim, wow, and death rates are coming down every year, and the chance of getting to 100 is going up every year. This is a really good reason for couples to postpone childbearing. <laughs> every couple of years you postpone childbearing, your kid's going to live an extra year, maybe. Okay, okay, every two years. Okay. Uh, now, there's one really large... Uh, there's one really large uncertainty here, and that is, what are all these laboratories that I told you about before, these laboratories that are more numerous than the demographers in the world, all these laboratories who are working on trying to slow down aging. And they've managed to slow down aging for nematode worms, and they've made some progress for uh, Drosophila, for fruit flies. They made a little bit of progress for mice and rats. So suppose they actually uh, find out what genetic changes would result in a slowing down of aging. And uh, the, the basic, uh, from an evolutionary biology point of view, the basic problem is as follows, that uh, individuals in a species only have a certain amount of energy, and they have to allocate the energy either to reproduction or to survival and maintenance, and there's an optimal allocation, and the optimal allocation is such that it's not optimal to spend enough on maintenance to keep your body in good shape. You, you, you gradually accumulate damage because you're not spending enough on maintenance. But if there's, we can figure out some genetic mechanism or some, some signal that you can send the body because of some substance like red wine and tell the body, listen, spend more of your energy on maintenance, don't worry about having 10 kids, then, then it might be possible to slow down the, the rate of aging. And, um, and slowing down the rate of aging could have really dramatic consequences. So suppose the rate of aging could be cut in half. Then, roughly speaking, people would live twice as long. Not quite, because there's accidents and infant mortality, but roughly. Uh, and if, so instead of living 80 years on average, people would live 160 years on average. And then if you cut it in half again, they'd live 320 years on average. I don't know if it's a, such a good idea, but there are thousands of people, tens of thousands of people working on this question right now. And the of course, they're all very optimistic, so they think they're going to understand how to slow aging next year, right? It might not be next year. It might be 30 years from now, 40 years from now, 50 years from now. But still, some people in this room and babies and younger children might benefit from this. And, um, and if you cut the rate of aging by 20%, if people live a little longer, then you cut it by another 20%, you cut it by another 20%, you cut it by another 20%. Or, or another way of saying it, instead of the increase um, in life expectancy going up six hours, per day, it goes up 8 hours a day, 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, 16 hours a day, 24 hours a day. Right? Okay. So I think there's some chance uh, that uh, some 
Italians alive today might celebrate their 200th birthdays. I don't know. I'm not going to be around. But, but this, is, this would really change the world. Um, now, the, the, uh, the history of forecasting of longevity of life expectancy has been a really sorry saga of uh, failure of expert imagination. And the, the, uh, here's a, a summary of uh, the forecasts to date. So the, the straight line here is what actually happened, what I showed you before, the linear rise. And then Lewis Dublin, the first, uh, who was the chief actuary of the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company, the world's largest insurance company in the 1920s, published the first estimate of the ultimate limit for human life expectancy. And he looked at life tables from a number of different countries, and he took the lowest level of mortality from different life tables, and he, he uh, worked on this uh, in the early uh, 1920s. And in 1923, he published the ultimate limit, which would never be exceeded unless some fantastic breakthrough could be made, some scientific fiction breakthrough could be made. And his ultimate limit was 65. So he published it here in 1923, and the limit was 65. He didn't have data for New Zealand. And New Zealand exceeded his ultimate limit three years prior to publication. <laughs> okay. So he tried again with Latka, the great mathematical demographer, 69. Well, they were exceeded one year after publication. That's better. And then tried again, 70, Bible, three score and 10. It was exceeded roughly at the time of publication. And then the whole series of other famous actuaries and demographers uh, making predictions. And always, this is an ultimate limit, and what they do is they assume, you can see these red dotted lines on the top, those are United Nations forecasts, but they assume some limit, and then they interpolate between where we are now and the limit for some curve that bends over. And they've, they've all uh, been exceeded, except for the very highest ones. Uh, so, the... Uh, the argument is that these, a lot of people make, uh, is that you can't extrapolate the past because the future is going to be different from the past. Right? And trying to forecast the future by looking at the past is like driving a car by looking in the rear view mirror. Right? Well, that's the quality of the argument. And the, 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 uh, but the, the, of course the future is going to be different from the past. And the, the, uh, we're going to make progress against different kinds of uh, diseases, against cancer and dementia, for example. Um, we're going to make progress in regenerating and eventually rejuvenating tissues and organs. They've regenerated the bladder in the laboratory. It's not the most exciting organ, but it's a, an organ. And, uh, and they're working on regenerating heart tissue and kidney tissue. Uh, the uh, progress is being made in in developing genotype-specific therapies and also in finding viral uh, viruses that can be used to replace uh, deleterious genes. Nano robots are being developed, little tiny robots as small as a cell. And that is, you put these little robots in your body and they go find cancer cells and kill them and they repair bones and so on. And, uh, and as I said, maybe we'll eventually start to be able to slow down the rate of aging. So people are working on all these things. It's not going to happen next year. It might not happen next decade, but within the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, some of this is going to happen. The, the, uh, the future will be different from the past. The, the, uh, the country that used to have the longest life expectancy was Sweden. Now it's Japan. Who knows what the country is going to be in the future? Uh, the cause of death, the, the original progress was made in reducing infectious disease, now it's chronic disease. Soon it's going to be the multiple syndromes of older people are going to be uh, reduced. And the, uh, and the ages, as I said, have shifted from, from childhood to old age. So let, let me show you a picture about that. The, uh, so in the second part of the 19th century, in the first part of the 20th century, almost all the progress in increasing life expectancy was due to progress in reducing diseases among younger adults and children almost old, hardly anything older ages. And then in the middle years, there was progress in, at the middle ages. And then now, the progress is almost entirely at the older ages. So that 
41% of the most recent increase in life expectancy has been due to progress in bringing death rates down after age. So, so there's been this shift, and this, this will probably continue, and we'll, get, we'll bring death rates down to higher and higher ages. The, uh, so that, that's why the, uh, the, the cost of the future will be different from the past. I think the best thing to do is to extrapolate. And the, the, uh, the past has taken into account all sorts of shocks, all sorts of things we didn't expect, all sorts of breakthroughs we didn't expect. They're all in the past record. And uh, put yourself back uh, at any point here on this curve. If you had been Lewis Dublin and in 1923 you said, let's just extrapolate the past, well, you'd be nuts. Any point on this line, if you had extrapolated the past, you would have been right. And at every point on this graph, the experts have been wrong. So the, uh, uh, so my bottom line here is, don't listen to experts. <laughs> but, but look at the data, right? Don't listen to me, but look at the data. So, but the, so let me just very briefly summarize, and then I'll open the floor for questions. So I started my talk off by saying that the, 20 years ago, there were three dominant views of longevity. Most people, by far the largest number of people, thought that we were close to a looming limit and that, and that was nothing could be done uh, about old age. Leonard Hayflick, the famous biologist, said, there's one and only one cause of death at older ages, and that's old age. And nothing can be done about old age. It's not true. just not true. And then the second uh, viewpoint was that there's some secret, and they're still looking for the secret. Maybe they'll find the secret. You drink 200 cases of red wine a day. <laughs> but they're looking for a pill that'll give you the same effect. And then, and then, then we discovered that we were actually were making progress. We were making remarkable progress. Uh, and then the, and the nature of this progress is really interesting. It's, it's not progress because of decelerating aging. It's progress because of postponing aging, which is unexpected. Why are we not decelerating aging? Why are we postponing aging? And then I, I talked briefly about the... Uh, the fact this was part of this long-term life expectancy revolution, that people are going to have to, uh, there's going to have to be some redistrib redistribution of work over the course of life, uh, that we don't have a really good understanding of the causes of the life expectancy revolution, but we think it's roughly 50% prosperity and roughly 50% medicine and public health, and uh, that the experts have been consistently wrong. Okay, thank you very much. So I'd be happy to field questions. So if you look at the age of the oldest person yeah. in a country, uh -huh. would that have shifted at yeah. the same rate? Or no. My anecdotal yeah. evidence suggests that that's not. No, no. So it's, so I showed you the picture of centenarians in Sweden. And I showed you a picture of 105 plus women in Japan. So there's been a really remarkable shift upwards. Uh, and the, the, uh, so far as we can tell, uh, centenarians were exceedingly rare before 1800. <laughs> let, me, let me step back a second. It's very hard to study centenarians because most of them are liars. Uh, they just, either they exaggerate their age or their grandnephew exaggerates their age. You know, or some doctor, the person dies, looks like 105. 105. So, so you have to uh, very, very carefully check birth certificates. And, uh, the, uh, we just had a meeting in Rome where we were talking about people who are 105 years old and older, 10 years old and older, so super centenarians. And uh, the, uh, there was a wonderful study done by the ISTAT, the Italian Statistical Office, about alleged centenarians in Rome. So this is not one. But the 15,000 super centenarians were reported in the registry. And they think the numbers might be six or seven. I mean, it's it's an enormous misreporting. It, it, part of it, in the case of Rome, is keeping people on the registry because you get more tax money if you keep people on the registry so people don't die. But, but also in countries like the United States, maybe in Italy too, you have a social security system, people get a social security number, maybe they lose their number, get another number, 
and then when they die, only the first one of the two numbers is reported as a death, and the other number just lives on forever. So there's uh, vastly more centenarians reported than there actually are. So you have to find birth certificates. And uh, so we've done a very careful study of, of uh, the length of life over the past few centuries. And so far as we can tell, there was nobody in Sweden who made it to 100 before 1800. Nobody. Um, and then just a very, very few people. And now you can see that there's 1,000 people in Sweden who made it to 100. How about 110? Well, again, it's hard because you can only study populations where you have good birth certificates and where you can link the birth certificate to the death certificate. So, but so far as we can tell, the first person to live past 110 probably lived in Ireland uh, and celebrated her 110th birthday in 1930. You know, maybe there's somebody else come pick up, but uh, now we have uh, verified records on 800 people who made it past 110, and we have records that we haven't verified yet on another 700 people, but they look good. So something like 1,500 people. So from one person in 1930 to 1,500 people today. And the 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 uh, but then. We get the max, and the maximum for women, in fact, the maximum for everybody is Madame Jean Louise Calmont. She died in Oral, and uh, she died at 122 and a half. And that she died in 1997. And uh, I met her when she was 115, and then I met her again the day after her 120th birthday. And and we've checked her record very, 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 very carefully, and found her birth certificate, her baptism when she graduated from school, and when she got married, and when her <coughs> daughter was born, and so on, when she bought a house. And so she's, she's valid. Uh, and she set the limit, I mean the maximum, 122, in 1997. Nobody's lived longer since then. But a lot of people are coming up, you know, there's quite a few 115-year-olds. Uh, nonetheless, she uh, is really quite remarkable. So one of the things we talked about in Rome was, when will the record be broken? given that all the numbers of people coming up. It'll probably be another 20 years before it's broken. And so she really was exceptional. Uh, but as, as you probably know, you know, maximums really fluctuate a lot. So but we're going to have to put up with this question for 20 more years. <laughs> we were sorry about this, to, to, to estimate this in Rome. But the, the, uh, uh, it will be broken, the record, uh, given all the people, numerous people coming up. So let me just tell you about the age trajectory of human mortality, which shed its light on this a little bit. The, uh, human mortality, as I showed you, rises more or less exponentially from age 30 to age 90 or so. And then it starts to level off. And uh, by studying these 800 supercentenarians, we've tentatively determined that human mortality reaches a peak at 110. So that's the good news, that population mortality don't, doesn't go up anymore after 110. The bad news is 50% per year. So, so there's a lot of selection. So to make it from 115 to 122, you know, it's only one chance in a couple hundred. So, so, uh, uh, but, but the number of people 110 is, is increasing a lot. Question here. Three questions. The, the first is a mark, and this is an interesting graph. It is one missing data observation, which is a prediction made much earlier than the one we have. Oh. Oh, yeah, 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 okay. yeah, 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 no, that's true, that is true. But, but this is interesting because, and this leads me to the other question, I think you talk, um, if you look, if I look, if I look at your talk, which was very interesting from the point of view of statistician, what is interesting is that you talk about means, not about confidence. Yeah, yeah. So, a question, I have a question on how, how wide are the confidence in the around this projection? And the second question is, this is about the time series of uh, confidence in yeah. the Then I have a question about the cross-section of confidence in the Because if I start uh, thinking about the integration of longevity, I think suppose that longevity is not even a distributor across the population mm -hmm. that reach uh, affected very differently uh, from longevity progress uh, and, and poor. This has huge implication for the fashion system. You should, first of all, yeah. when it comes out of your uh, message you're talking, you should index the time. Yeah, yeah. But then you should index it not to the average. Yeah, 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 yeah. So 
about Yeah. So anyway, it depends on what we're looking at. So um, Nathan Kiefitz, when he wrote his book of Applied Mathematical Demography, he said in the preference, there's no statistics in this book. What he meant was statistical inference, because all the confidence intervals are zero. Because when you're dealing with millions or tens of millions of people, you know everything, you know, point oh, 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 one. Okay. Of course, when you get up to the higher ages, and there's only 800 people left, then you start needing statistics. Uh, and then, and you're absolutely right, when you're forecasting, we have this uh, long time series. You can see the underlying points here. Uh, but sure, if you apply, do some time series analysis, it's going to open up. Uh, depending on what kind of analysis you do. And then if you take into account the fact that maybe we'll slow down the rate of aging, then of course the confidence intervals have to get even bigger, or if you take into account the fact that there could be some disaster. Um, so so the, the uh, sure, I, I would not be surprised if, if uh, the rate of progress went from, from uh, six hours a day to eight hours a day, or went from six hours a day to four hours a day over the next couple of decades. Um, populations are very heterogeneous, as you said, and therefore we're, we're just dealing with averages, but there's some heterogeneity, some variance around the averages. And the, um, so one of the things that we've been doing is, is spending a lot of time and effort trying to study the impact of heterogeneity on mortality and how heterogeneity affects mortality. The, the reason there's a, there's a plateau of human mortality at 110 is not because individual mortality levels off of 110. I met uh, Jean-Louise Calmo when she was 115, I met her when she was 120. She was definitely older than 120, no question about it, weaker, frail. So, so far as we can tell, uh, for individuals like you and me, mortality keeps on going up, keeps on going up at about the same rate. Uh, this Gumpert's equation, the uh, rate of aging seems to be about the same uh, at all ages, above 30. And the reason that uh, mortality appears to level off is, of course, it's enormous selection. The frail tend to die first, half the population is dying. You remove the frailer half, the stronger half get to be a year older, and the two <coughs> phenomena cancel out. And by, oh, I, I'm not using this anymore, but I, I hope it works. The, 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 uh, the, the, uh, by studying the extreme case of mortality after 110 and seeing what this balance is between selection and aging, we're able to estimate how much variation there is in, rates of, in, in uh, mortality rates in human populations. And if you extrapolate it back, you can make some estimates at younger ages. So there's a lot of heterogeneity. Anyway. Yes? Um, can you come back a couple of slides together? Sure. Table. This one? Right. So you said that basically the reason why mortality is decreasing has to do with money and with medicine. Yeah, and broadly it, speaking. Broadly. Yeah. <laughs> Here we see that basically this is evolving. Yeah. I mean, there's a sense in which this is a little bit kind of a paradox. It looks like as population become older, then probably more money and production is yeah. spending on elderly people. Yes. Yeah. It looks a lot like this is going on. Yeah. No, but see. So the, the natural experiment of East-West German unification, which that happened in 1990, so we're talking about this here. And uh, uh, the, uh, what, what happened in the 19th century, in the early part of the 20th century, that, that's a different story. But, but the, and the, there have been a number of studies. Uh, James Riley wrote a book on the rise in life expectancy. And, and he, he tried to break it down into, by medicine, he, uh, there wasn't much medicine back then, but there was a lot of public health. So cleaner water, cleaner food. Um, and, uh, and, and he thinks that, that uh, public health, broadly defined, it might be half of what's going on. And the, and the other half is prosperity, you know, that people are richer and therefore they can feed themselves better and clothe themselves better and get better education and so on. So, but it's very rough, very, very rough. And of course, money and medicine interact in complicated ways, so, so it's a very crude decomposition. But, but, there's, but there's lots and lots of different factors that influence uh, the length of life. And, and the important thing is, you can think about it in two ways. One is, what are the factors that influence the average length of life, life expectancy, in a population? And then, what are the factors that influence the fact that some people live longer than average and some people live shorter than average? And the, the average length of life in a population seems to depend 
on the level of prosperity in the population and, and the level of medicine and public health that's available at that time. So, so that uh, even if you wanted to live to 90, if, when you, if you were born 200 years ago, you'd have a hard time living to 90 because it, it just wasn't the prosperity in the public health to give you the capability of living to 90. Uh, of course, a few people do. But, but then, so, that, so, that the, so the average level of health depends on social factors. The, the, the fact that some people live shorter and some people live longer, that depends to a large extent on individual behavior and how much you invest in your health and how much you take care of yourself. Uh, there's lots of ways of dying young. Smoking, drinking when you drive, drugs. Lots, lots and lots of ways to die, to die young. It's hard to live long. Uh, but if you listen to your mother, then you'll probably live longer than average. So that, that's what we've discovered based on millions of dollars of research. That uh, get a good night's sleep, eat breakfast, have fun but not too much fun, drink but not too much, put a hat on when it's cold, put a coat on when it's raining. Those are the kinds of things that help people live longer than average. Have some good genes. That's 25 percent. I'm totally aware that you will not reply to my question saying deeply, so it's a personal opinion. Um, what, you, what you say was very pleasing to hear, but after a while I started to be concerned about uh, the living condition of the elderly persons. I thought about my grandmother and she's not going outside of her house. She's not been outside for eight years because she cannot move. So I thought, uh, do you think that we will be able to accompany these um, higher expected ages with uh, uh, better life conditions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the evidence on this is fairly, well, it's complicated because it's hard to measure complicated. Uh, but I wrote a review article about this that came out of the last a couple of years ago, together with my people who looked at 250 articles to uh, try to uh, figure out what was happening to the health of people who lived more and more. And the, if you put everything all together and take your bike over to and kind of squint at the evidence, that then uh, it appears that the healthy length of life is going to about the same pace as the total age. So that there's a period of uh, debility at the end of the life to be bad health that many people suffer with their own life. But this is tended to be pushed out to the higher age. So many people in the future will still have five or ten years of poor health at the end of life, but it'll be five or ten years of poor health in the level of the hunt instead of the uh, But it's, I have to caution uh, this because it depends on how you measure health. So there's really three states of health. You can be alive, you can be sick, and you can be dead. And a lot of these studies don't take into account being dead. That's a really bad thing. So there's a lot of people who are alive because they have a pacemaker. They're alive because they take, oh, I shouldn't do this here. Sorry. They're alive because they're taking beta blocks, right? They're alive because they had cancer, but it's in remission. So, so they're sick. You know, they, they have cardiovascular disease, but they're still alive. Um, so if you look at the prevalence of chronic diseases, it's going up. And that's because people are alive instead of being dead. So, 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 so if you adjust for the fact that generally being alive is better than being dead, then you get the result that health seems to be going up at about the same pace as life expectancy. So that question come on. <laughs> so the, the broader thing you've said is that, is that really we could think about a same life expectancy that would stretch way past 120 and get upwards yeah. of 200. Yeah. Is, is the mechanisms that have produced, like given this graph, yeah. focused on one segment of the population, yeah. we fix the things that kill children, and we fix the things that kill adults, yeah. and we're starting to fix the things. Are the mechanisms that, that are going to produce that next wave, this fourth kind of stage of life expectancy, in, in your view, the same as what we've seen for what has produced the, the 80 to 100, or what might produce the 80 to 100? Yeah, to some extent, yes. So, so I think there's going to be further postponement due to further progress against cancer and dementia and, you know, things that are in the works right now. And, uh, and, uh, and as I said, maybe uh, regeneration of organs and helping your heart regenerate after you have a heart attack, things like that. 
um, so incremental medicine. But then, the, but then there's this uh, possibility that we can actually slow down the rate of aging. So the, the theory is that every day we suffer lots and lots of damage. In fact, it's amazing. We have lots of cells and millions of our cells get damaged every day. The, the DNA gets damaged. And, uh, but the body repairs 99.9% .9 of the damage. But there's a little bit that doesn't get repaired. And this builds up. And the, this cumulative buildup of damage is what is thought to cause aging. That, that's the main hypothesis. And so the, the, the people who are working on slowing down the rate of aging, they're, they're trying to get the body to upregulate uh, repair, repair and maintenance. So that instead of repairing 99.9% .9 of the damage, you repair 99.99% of the damage. And the theory goes that you could do that, you could just slow down the rate of aging. Um, and the, and, the, and the, the theory has different variants, but one is, you know, today, so the, the evolutionary theory of aging says that species have limited resources and they have to allocate the resources to reproduction or to repair and maintenance, and they, because it's important to have babies, they allocate some to reproduction, there's not enough left to allocate the maintenance. So we don't need 10 kids anymore, as I mentioned, so maybe you could shift that balance. But most of us don't have 10 kids anymore either, so it's a little hard to understand why this balance has not shifted. And then the other thing is, these theories depend on, we have limited resources, but, you know, we all have unlimited resources. We can eat as much as we want to. We just get fat. So, so, is there some way of, instead of getting fat, to use that extra energy for repair? Yeah, but you have to tell the body to do this. We, we don't know how to tell the body to do this. But we have to tell the body, give the body some signal to, to upregulate uh, maintenance and repair. And, and they've done it for worms. Our second cousins, you know. So, okay. <laughs> No, that, so let me see if I can get... Let me see how... Maybe I can get back to this. Uh, no, it doesn't work. Okay. Uh, oh, here we are. Yeah. coming. Here, okay, so, and then here. So, 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 you can see that a number of countries were doing very badly all the way up until 1900. Italy, in 1900, had a life expectancy below 45. And the, so, so over the over the long course of human history, there were many populations that had life expectancies of 20 or 25. And it, there's been some work done on hunter-gatherers, so you have some estimates of this, and, and there's been some work done using skeletal remains to try to estimate how old people are. And so life expectancies of 20, 25 are pretty typical, and then there were some exceptional populations which might have had a life expectancy of 30 or 35. So, so like, well, I, in the previous picture I showed you the English uh, over, the, over this period of the... 15 and 1600s. So, and the Italian pattern, the very bad, very low life expectancy, even very rapid catch up. That's uh, typical of many developing countries today, although they started much later. But in, uh, in many developing countries, there's been an enormously rapid uh, catch up. In China, for example. Uh, so that there's been a, a convergence. In the countries in which progress is being made, there's been a convergence toward the maximum. Of course, there are exceptions. So in Eastern Europe, in Russia in particular, Ukraine, life expectancy has been going down. And in black Africa, because of AIDS, life expectancy has been going down. But generally, there's been this kind of convergence. Uh, 
And, but the, but the long-term history of human life expectancy, so far as we can tell, life expectancy fluctuated depending on the population between 20 and 35 for a long, long period of time, but no, no systematic change. Thank you very much. Okay.